Hello everyone and welcome to this. This is our class on William Easterly's The White Man's Burden. And uh, as per the last time we met here on YouTube, um, I'm um, sort of trying to focus my goals a little bit uh, here. I, I don't want to sort of talk about the book in too much detail. What I want to do instead is set a context for you in terms of how the book was received, how it relates to some of the other books we've looked at, and then uh, in hopefully so doing, make the journey of your own reading of the book a little uh, less burdensome for you um, and give you something to sort of hold on to as you're reading the book. So with that said in mind then let's talk about William Easterly's White Man's Burden. So last time we were meeting we talked about uh, Jeffrey Sachs and we talked about his view um, on the possibilities of aid as being sort of uh, really just sort of a very simple problem that that aid isn't uh, you know uh, uh, you know, necessarily a tool that has uh, uh, outlived its purpose, that it still has a lot of life left in the old girl, so to speak, and that uh, with the enthusiastic support of people like Bono and everyone else, what we can do is we can bring information uh, to the world about the need for aid, number one, and number two, we can realize that at the end of the day, for people in the bottom billion, uh, the uh, plight or the need for aid is actually quite urgent. Elsewhere in the world, of course, we're off the uh, uh, need for help in getting on that development ladder, but uh, or we're past the need for getting onto the bottom of the development ladder. Those countries are looking after themselves. But for people in the bottom billion, oftentimes it's the very simple forms of aid that can really be of most assistance. So um, with that said, then, uh, what is Easterly's response to this? Well, Easterly um, seems to be arguing effectively that uh, for Sachs, Aid is really just a technical problem. All that needs for to happen really is for the world's leading practitioners to to act. Um, uh, the uh, and we've discussed that, right? The the uh, the idea that Bono and Sachs have is bringing awareness to the world's practitioners about the need for aid, and then if they can get the aid to follow, the problem will will be resolved. The debt forgiveness, as well, is a form of aid in that instance. Um, now, Easterly is basically saying that this shows a kind of a remarkable naivety about the true roots of poverty in the world. Um, really what's going on in the world is that you have political elites, political elites, excuse me, governing elites who seek mainly to protect their own position, sometimes in very entrenched and corrupt uh, positions, it should be said. Uh, they have dysfunctional institutions like corruption and the lack of property rights, which we've discussed, I think, another time. Um, uh, we have a long history also of uh, exploitation and meddling from abroad um, in these cultures, harkening back sometimes to the colonial era, the slave trade, uh, the creation of artificial states. Um, you know, some of these states have very strange borders running through them. Um, and of course, military interventions and interference. Um, the West during the Cold War, for example, having propped up some seriously problematic individuals. Um, and uh, in fairness, having denied um, a much political, having participated in the denial of, of political autonomy and democracy to the lot to a lot of people who lived in these areas. So, um, to to all of this, uh, this this history of uh, the legacy of imperialism, to this uh, sort of uh, history of corrupt rule stemming from that history. Um, um, uh, Easterly has a question. Um, is Sachs serious when he says that all of this can be reversed with a mere $75 billion? Uh, um, this is suggestive for Easterly of an amnesia. Generations, in fact, of foreign experts have tried to address Africa's uh, problems. The only way these problems are going to be fixed, he's suggesting, is if there is homegrown political, economic, and social reformers that... Uh, that, that, that come forward. Now, homegrown political reformers and entrepreneurs, that seems like an interesting uh, framework that contrasts starkly with uh, Sachs's perspective, um, which does, for want of a better term, look like a much more top-down approach. Um, if you uh, unleash, however, the power of markets, says Easterly, then you get a bottom-up kind of activity um, where these seekers, as he calls them, um, will, uh, will, will sort of uh, come into uh, the arena 
of circulation of goods and services and see what it is actually that needs to be done. And uh, for this reason then, if we can say that this book has a kind of a, uh, a main point, it is that grand schemes really don't help us very much when we're trying to uh, seek solutions to these age-old problems. There's been too many grand schemes, says Easterly. What is better is if we have bottom-up trial and error uh, efforts uh, to see what works and build bottom-up solutions, sometimes at a very small scale, um, to, um, to, to, to try to basically get some kind of economy going in these places. And that, once an economy is present, then um, good things will flow from this. So in keeping up with this sort of uh, theme and this aspiration to set up a, a kind of a market-based approach to aid, uh, uh, Easterly cites the example of the Harry Potter book launch. Uh, here he says, um, effectively a miracle took place, right? Um, people from all over the world uh, managed to get their copy of the Harry Potter book within a very, very short period of time, 24, 48 hours. And this is basically, he says, an, a, a testimony to the tremendous power of markets. The uh, companies were able to anticipate um, how much of the book would be required. They were able to build up a stock of that book, and then on launch day, the book was delivered to where it needed to be, and people paid the price of the book, and, um, and the rest is history. Everyone got paid, and the company made a tidy profit as a result. So how come it's so hard then to get 12 cent medicines to children to prevent half of all the malaria deaths in the world? Uh, the West is spending $2.3 trillion on foreign aid over the last five decades and still uh, doesn't seem to be able to pull off this, uh, this very worthy goal. Um, and so he says, big plans will always fail to reach the beautiful goal. Um, now a little sort of a footnote here about the white man's burden as a title of the book. It's borrowed, in case you don't know, from the Rudyard Kipling novel, or excuse me, poem, of the, uh, the, the, the this phrase comes from it where he says that the, uh, effectively in, in this poem he's arguing that uh, the imperial mission is a noble one. The imperial mission is a uh, a one a goal that we should be proud to pursue. Of course, Rudyard Kipling was writing. Uh, he wrote uh, Jungle Book and and other um, other books kind of like that. Maybe written more for children. Those famous ones that we know, uh, like Ricky Tiki Tavi, etc. Uh, but um, uh, Kipling's uh, point being here in this poem that that really. Um, the, uh, the work that the white man has to do is a difficult one, but somebody has to do it because otherwise these places in the world will always remain backwards and savage. And of course, many people would respond to that today and say that's kind of a racist, uh, um, kind of, it is a racist uh, attitude. Um, but um, I want to be clear um, that uh, Easterly is using this title sarcastically um, he believes, in fact, that it is uh, where, where once it was the British racists who ran um, the uh, empire of the world. Uh, now it is perhaps um, a much more sort of weird postmodern liberal imperialism that uh, runs the world. And consequently, it is uh, uh, pursuing these goals often with the best of intentions but also with a very sort of um, special notion of its own purpose. Or, uh, and, and it is this special purpose, um, um, our exceptional nature, that I think Easterly is most powerfully trying to challenge. And my personal opinion is that he's very successful in this book. This is a complicated book insofar as it's hard to know really where he's coming from. Um, as a footnote, we could ponder the question, you know, is he liberal or is he conservative? Uh, so much of what he says seems to be um, a criticism from this perspective of, you know, trying to get these well-intentioned white people who think that they're all that off the backs of these Africans who will then, we imagine, be able to get on with the worthy task of, of, of running their own lives. Why should the West always be intervening in these parts of the world? Um, Easterly has a uh, uh, you know, a clear sense, I think that, 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 and I think he's onto something, um, certainly. 
But um, the problem, I think, with Easterly, perhaps, is that in his assertion constantly of a free market mentality, that the searchers are the constant goal to foreign aid, I think perhaps as Amartya Sen argues um, in response to him, and I'll come back to this later in the lecture, um, that he uh, maybe uh, has a tendency to, to lump too many things together, to say that the West has never had any um, been successes pursuing aid. Well, in fact, halfway through the book, he actually doubles back on this and seems to uh, list some areas where the West has indeed been quite successful in pursuing aid. So it's not clear that um, that 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 this uh, you know anti-aid uh, argument is a uniformly applicable one. It's a lot to do with the fact that I think this is a very rhetorical book. It has a lot of data and a lot of information, um, but it's squeezed into this very narrow framework that aid is always and everywhere wrong. Um, it seems that Easterly is arguing that the more aid is thrown at the situation, the less productive it is. But as Amartya Sen argues, it's hard to see that aid has ever actually been harmful. Um, perhaps aid has not always done much good, but it's hard to see that it's never been harmful. And um, uh, not that that's necessarily an argument for aid, but what it is is a suggestion that maybe we could be doing aid better, or that maybe that there is a space for aid, or thinking about aid, um, that uh, we have not maybe been able to innovate yet. That said, the point of the book, and I think where the book stands very strongly, is in its sort of uh, embrace of an anti-condescending, a critique of the Western condescension that sort of seems to be prevalent in a lot of these uh, development uh, plans. I think um, Easterly has a strong argument to be made there, and uh, we'll see some of that argument now as we move forward. So. One of the seminal moments in the book uh, involves this point where he says the right plan is to have no plan. Um, I, I think you know this quote to me really sort of captures this kind of uh, MacGyver style um, uh, impression that uh, that Easterly has in his head of how searchers, this category of people that he calls searchers, how they how they work, what role they play, and their place in the uh, task here. So, he says, in foreign aid, planners announce good intentions but don't motivate anyone to carry them out. Searchers find things that work and get some reward. Um, mm -hmm, indeed. Planners raise uh, expectations but take no responsibility for meeting them. Hmm. We'll see in the argument that he makes why that's so. Um, searchers accept responsibility for their actions. Planners determine what to supply. Searchers find out what is in demand. Planners apply global blueprints. Searchers adapt to local conditions. Planners at the top lack knowledge at the bottom. Searchers find out what the reality is at the bottom. Planners never hear whether the plan got what it, what it needed. Um, uh, searchers find out whether the customer is satisfied. So there's this kind of um, whiz kid ideal of the uh, the searcher here that, that Easterly is putting forward. And it's an important and powerful concept in fairness. Um, I want to be perfectly upfront here. I myself am um, convinced that that there's there's a lot of merit in markets, right? I mean markets are very, very useful things. Um, they are probably the best things that we've ever come across really in terms of being able to allocate resources to um, often uh, very complex problems. And, um, and that, that ability of the market cannot be gainsaid. That said, in exchange for that, however, markets do have tremendous issues attached to them. They are not perfect. In fact, Easterly would be the first to admit that. Uh, markets tend to work better when they're evolving naturally. Uh, they're not something that's generally that all, that all too easily uh, created or, or constructed um, artificially. Um, that's one thing that we need to know. Um, so uh, in that case, then, uh, Easterly runs the risk of being advocated or, or coming over as advocating a kind of a, a slowly, slowly, um, let things develop naturally kind of approach. And and many people would say, as, as you know, John Maynard Keynes, the great economist, might say, that's fine and good, but in the long run, we're all dead. And um, I think in a, in a world where we are concerned for the plight of um, uh, uh, people who are uh, uh, suffering in their lives, it is only natural to try to want to help them out. And I think that's the point that Jeffrey Sachs and Bono and others last week are making. Uh, 
So, um, so try, let's, let's try then to move through this text a little bit more and see what it is that uh, Easterly feels can be done to try to help the plight of the searchers and what arguments he can make to uh, convince us that planners uh, maybe don't have um, it all as well figured out as they think they do. Um, so first of all, some clarifications, I guess. What is he, what is he not saying? Well, he's not anti-aid per se. And then there's one really, really important thing that in teaching this book, I found it helpful to emphasize this because some people um, might read his opening lines especially and, and say that, you know, what's, what, what he's really saying here is that it's impossible for human beings to help each other or that worse, that we have no responsibility to help each other. And I don't think he's saying that at all. In fact, um, he is... Um, what the book is, is it's an argument against the way aid is currently administered. This is not some kind of elite corporate intellectual uh, saying that uh, the affluent, the rich, have no moral responsibility to help anyone else at all. Um, and nor is he saying, in fact, when he talks about culture matters, he's not saying that the um, that the poor people in these countries are somehow culturally defective, right? Um, sure, definitely trust is lacking in these countries, but there's all kinds of ways in which trust is present in and, and often difficult to measure. Trust, of course, being a fundamental tenet of how markets work, right? So, um, importantly then, uh, the, uh, the task of uh, finding ways to stimulate a linkage between markets and the uh, specific tasks that we need to accomplish in terms of providing aid for people, well, he outlines a couple of examples for them around page 54 onwards, um, how the Dutch helped with deworming um, drugs, and the, the circulation administration of those, the use of oral rehydration therapy for diarrheal diseases, indoor spraying to control malaria, programs to slow down the spread of AIDS. All of these have, have um, he's showing evidence in the book of how planners um, have failed in these areas where seekers and searchers have actually been quite successful. So there's a strong element there then that, that uh, you know, if we're looking to help people, and of course he is, he's well-intentioned in this, in this goal, um, we can use these market-based approaches. But that said, one thing that's very, very important to recognize about Easterly's argument is that he's opposed to, how should I put it, um, mm. radically trying to, um, you know, impose aid on people. Um, aid um, cannot um, uh, uh, be um, well. What I mean, I mean, I mean something else. So let me let me backtrack. He, what he's opposed to is he's opposed to um, this uh, kind of idea that his ideas might, for example, be interpreted very radically, and that we might try to go around imposing. Um, as, as the West did in relation to uh, Russia at the end of the Cold War, a kind of shock therapy, right? He's being quite uh, honest with us then in his understanding of, of the importance of seekers um, because sometimes you get planners of the market as well. Does that make sense? Um, so their approach to aid would be a bit different to his because they would say, look, the solution is that you go into these countries and you just privatize everything and set up free markets and do everything overnight. He admits that he used to think that way, but after seeing what happened in Russia, no way, right? So you better, you really are better off letting markets develop naturally um, and opening up space for them at, at a reasonable pace and a reasonable speed um, in order to allow the function of the markets to come through. So, um, so it, Definitely, there's some balance in his argument in, the, in relation to that. Um, and I wouldn't want anyone coming away from uh, the book saying that he doesn't believe in aid at all or that he believes that markets just need to be introduced overnight and then nobody should have to ever sort of care for anyone ever again kind of thing. That's not the point at all. Um, what he's simply looking for is a way for us to take all this money that we've uh, been investing in aid and not having any results with it and maybe you know, backing off with it a little bit and trying to see on a case-by-case -case basis where maybe somebody could do with a little bit of extra money, perhaps um, 
but really getting out of the way I think would be the best argument uh, best way to put it uh, getting out of the way of local entrepreneurs and people who already know um, what they want and as we'll as we'll develop in our analysis of the book here um, there's very good reason for getting out of the way because um, oftentimes uh, the aid um, at organizations have a tendency to um, replicate each other's um, uh, purposes and um, in so doing they create they kind of crowd out um, the possibility of achieving any good because they're all clamoring for the same thing the aid agencies are kind of competing each other then uh, competing with each other then for um, these resources and arguing that the, what what's needed is more and more uh, aid so let's develop that point now. Potholes, some successes, and bureaucrats. Well, I think one of the best chapters um, in the book is, I think it's chapter five, where he says that the poor get bureaucrats. And he's trying to argue why that's so. Uh, really, if you want to solve a pothole, the way aid is currently uh, set up, he says, uh, potholes um, have, um, you know, uh, been a particular curse for countries like it, that have you know bad roads and, and often poor countries have bad roads so um, as he notes on page 173 175 money from the aid networks often takes a long time to get through um, to fix a pothole and it takes a lot of money to fix a pothole because obviously there's a lot of labor involved if you're using the aid transmission belt to get the money to the pothole the pothole itself takes maybe five dollars ten dollars to to fix but um, to get the permission the paperwork written up to get the government agents to write off on the check to fix the pothole uh, he's he's exaggerating this is a comic example this is not actually how it works in real life but what he's trying to do is show the efficiency uh, impact that it does take and he's right here that there are a lot of resources in terms of labor um, you know bureaucratic hierarchies that kind of thing um, to, involved in getting um, from point A to point B here so uh, a fifty dollar twenty dollar job suddenly ends up costing us maybe eighty thousand dollars or something right um, so how does uh, this square with the uh, goal that we all have which is that giving our money to charities giving our money to aid agencies whether through our tax dollars or out of our pocket um, you know what he's saying is we need to be careful to make sure that what we're doing is we're giving money to that that has an impact on the local level that's very very important um, so it's not that this approach has never worked um, there are examples he offers on page 175 onwards of where, where, um, and we've cited some previously in the lecture as well, um, where uh, you know parents have been paid by the World Bank to um, to uh, to send their kids to school, which is which is you know really kind of a counterintuitive thing, but he's interested in you know what's happening there, the incentive effect, which is remarkable. So foreign aid likely contributed there, um, he notes. And also, in fairness, he's saying that, you know, foreign aid has brought mortality rates down, um, you know, literacy rates have increased. So, you know, there's definitely, uh, you know, some merits to this. But I think it's the grotesque amount of money that's being spent and the very uh, slight impact that it has. And he notes that in the whole sort of series of examples of, of how aid is allocated only some t certain types of them seem to show results um, but in the meantime we have the aid agencies themselves firing off in all directions like Yosemite Sam um, just firing randomly at everything that moves right um, well, what we mean by that in, in applying that metaphor is that they're firing at, at, at as many goals as they possibly can possibly out of fear that the next agency across the way is going to try to get in on their turf and uh, take their authority away from them um, or their resources away from them so this is kind of a, um, a public services kind of uh, argument here and he uses this term tragedy of the commons um, here which is interesting you know that that um, if none of us really um, know who uh, 
how to talk to each other about our common problems, then our common problems seem to get worse and worse all the time. And these aid agencies are not very good at talking to each other, is the point. Um, they don't uh, have uh, a, a history or legacy of coordinating their efforts very well. Um, they're pursuing their ideas and their plans in-house um, and uh, often end up working against each other um, or um, spending money needlessly where only the money of one of them would have been sufficient. So um, this, is a, this is a huge problem. He also cites later in the book a thing called the Kitty Genovese um, effect and this is a murder that he remembers um, uh, reading about in the newspapers when he was uh, when he was younger, but um, it's a situation. One of the first crimes that he can remember reading about as a child. Um, he uh, was talking with his mother about it, and and they were reading about how uh, the tragedy of this uh, situation was that something like thirty or forty people uh, saw um, the murder, and uh, there was a genuine opportunity to help the girl. Um, who had been attacked because she was still alive after she had been hit, but then the criminal came back to finish her off. And um, the um, question is, you know, couldn't something have been done uh, for her? Um, well, um, the, um, <clears throat> the, 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 the unhappy story is that the... the, the is that the, the, our aid agencies are kind of exactly in the same boat. Um, and it's hard to get them to relate to each other. It's hard to get them to cooperate with each other in this sense because they also um, have have this tendency to sort of stand idly by, um, uh, in a sense, because just as the observers of this crime, there's a there's a kind of a, 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 an assumption, I suppose, in their one part that well, somebody's going to do it, right? Somebody's going to go and make the call. Um, somebody has seen this. It doesn't have to necessarily be me. Um, and so no one really need, knows uh, who's, who has to be the person to actually move to get the job done. And communication could really solve this, is the point. So what's the bottom line here? Um, the bottom line, he seems to be arguing, is that um, that despite all this noisy anti-globalization protesting and for debt relief, the hardworking NGOs, the rock bands and movie stars, i.e. Bono, and the rich country governments increased interest in the rest after in the rest coming after 9-11, um, is that the constituency for the poor is growing. That's the good news. It's time for the rich country public to insist that aid money actually reach the poor. That's his bottom line argument. That, that, And I think that's the takeaway message from the book. That aid money as it's being spent right now is not effective and uh, could be so much better implemented. Um, there's an interesting uh, a sort of a, a, a sidestep in the book to talk about um, uh, imperialism and the tradition and history of imperialism. Um, he also sort of, I think, puts it out there that maybe you could think about the, those who are calling to, after 9-11, people like Niall Ferguson um, calling after 9-11 for a kind of a postmodern empire, for a kind of a new global empire. Uh, he's very suspicious of that idea. Um, he says, historian Harvard, historian Niall Ferguson, whose work on every topic but this I greatly admire, says that there is such a thing as liberal imperialism and that on balance it was a good thing. In many cases of economic backwardness, a liberal empire can do better than a nation state. Um, well, you know, as, as Easterly rightly observes, um, you know, the, 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 um, the fact is that terrible things happened under the empire and um, uh, it was not very democratic um, and it didn't really do uh, on the whole a very good job. Um, in fact, Amartya Sen takes that criticism in his response to Easterly even further and notes that, you know, actually, you know, um, there were huge famines in India. Uh, the subject of, um, uh, which, which was a, 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 a colony of British imperial rule. Um, and in fact, the last one, just as in Ireland, in India, um, the, the famine of 1943 killed between two or three million people um, four years before Indian independence. So, um, interestingly, with the end of the British Empire, and ever since the end of the British Empire, India hasn't had one single famine. So um, perhaps there's an interesting tension there in response to um, to Easterly, because in fact India is a, a country that has used a lot of government um, technologies to 
uh, make sure that that doesn't happen. It certainly hasn't been a, the most market-centric country um, that you can imagine. Um, so I've mentioned Amartya Sen a couple of times, and uh, he wrote a book review. Uh, he's a famous economist in his own right. He wrote a book review of Easterly's book, and I was inspired by that in putting together some of these comments. Um, he basically summarizes uh, in saying that he thinks that Easterly is onto something in his critique of Sachs to be sure that um, formulaic thinking and policy triumphalism um, are not necessarily the best way to uh, help um, poor people in developing countries. Um, he says that Easterly is right to note that the failure of many grand schemes results from their disregard for the complexity that exists on the ground. Um, and we do need to think about incentive systems. Um, we do need to think about how individual initiative fits into um, this uh, picture, right? Because people need people who are uh, often very, very poor have com are completely alienated, of course, from their power, and they don't feel they have much to uh, contribute um, to the situation that they find themselves in. So. Um, uh, Easterly is right in that sense. The book is a good book in that sense to to ask the question of how some of these problems can be bypassed. Um, but uh, says Sen, uh, the conclusions may well be overblown. Um, is it in fact that aid has done harm, or it's done maybe just not much good? Um, and Sen, I think, in that sense, is trying to inspire us to think about how, for example. Um, famines have been solved through, um, you know, emergency response measures, that kind of thing, um, and prevented in the future through um, strong, uh, although community and socially based uh, systems that are um, even in a very sometimes corrupt country like India, that that people power has been organized through vertically integrated government initiatives and. Um, and famines have been prevented. Um, so perhaps uh, if, uh, as Sen argues, Easterly were to cast a wider net and look at the data a little bit better, uh, he would find that sometimes um, verticality has some has has much to 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 recommend it. Um, so we leave it at there for today, guys, and I look forward to discussing this book with you in more detail when we meet in class. Thanks very much. Bye bye.